Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our program, Quiet Quitting and Quiet Firing. Is it happening at your company? Today, I am joined by my esteemed colleagues, Catherine Brustowitz and Beth Davis. So let's talk about what you, what you can expect during our program today. Quiet quitting and quiet firing are relatively new terms that now impact employees and employers alike. How should an employer deal with an underperforming employee? What are the business and legal ramifications? What is an employee, what if an employee believes that they are being doomed to failure? There are undoubtedly risks that an employee faces when quietly quitting. Is quiet quitting the best approach from an employee's perspective? What about from an employer's perspective? Catherine and Beth are going to talk about these points. And when they finish, we're going to present a top 10 list, which will give you some powerful takeaways. So let's get cracking. Catherine, the actions taken by an employee that now constitute quiet quitting are not new. However, we are hearing a great deal about it recently. Can you help us to better understand what quiet quitting looks like? Absolutely, David. So quiet quitting can take different shapes and forms, but generally it's the concept of employees gradually becoming less engaged with work, less responsive to their team and to their managers, and becoming less available overall. The employee is likely still maintaining the very bare minimum of their job responsibilities, at least as they understand them, but they're less engaged and no longer have the motivation to go above and beyond. Perhaps they don't appear on camera during virtual meetings or fail to speak up in meetings or group discussions unless directly addressed. I would imagine that quiet quitting creates risks. Let's start by talking about risks that this creates from the employer's perspective. I imagine that when an employee is doing the bare minimum, it creates an impact on the team, among other things. Yeah, you're spot on, David. I think it's really important to tackle this question from two or even three different perspectives. There are risks of quiet quitting to the workplace, and there are different risks to the quiet quitter themselves. I will start by addressing the risks to the workplace. Those risks include the repercussions of the quiet quitter's poor performance. Maybe the quiet quitter is moving slower than their team needs them to move. Perhaps they're missing deadlines or barely meeting deadlines. That puts stress on other colleagues to pick up the slack. That in turn leads to another risk. The quiet quitter's behavior is frustrating other employees. For example, David, let's say that you found yourself in a rut and I've noticed that you're progressively only doing the bare minimum in meeting your responsibilities. I might not only start holding that against you, but I might start to think to myself, well, if David is getting away with being a poor performer and missing deadlines, then why am I going above and beyond, working hard, picking up his slack, and continuing to meet my deadlines? He's still getting paid his salary, you know, I think I might start slacking too. Hey, that Catherine, is... hang on one second. Are you suggesting that I'm a poor performer? Oh, by no means good, sir. I'm simply using this as an illustration, a potential example. Okay. <laughs> Let's say that you were a slacker, a poor performer. I would say that your behavior is a dangerous and contagious mentality to some of your colleagues and employees looking on and seeing how you're still getting paid your your regular salary and you're just you're not uh you're not going above and beyond anymore so you must understand that quiet quitting understandably has a negative effect on employee morale and engagement as well ultimately you know it can lead to increased turnover too which of course leads to higher labor costs the employer is still paying full salary for someone who's not pulling their full weight they may need to pay other employees to patch the gaps as well. Or if they don't pay other employees to patch the gaps, those employees are going to become resentful 
that their workload has increased while their compensation has remained the same. So those are a few of the risks to the workplace and to the quiet quitters colleagues. Catherine, those are some powerful thoughts, especially on the heels of the great resignation. Good points. So the impact on employee morale and engagement makes a lot of sense. What about the quiet quitter? Does that person also face risks? Certainly. So as you mentioned, there are indeed risks to the quiet quitter. If you're an employee who's quietly quitting, putting in less effort, perhaps being less responsive or less available or less engaged, you're actually increasing your own risk of being demoted or fired. In the current market, lots of employers are looking to cut costs, especially in the face of increased costs and continued inflation. If there is an employee who is not being productive, they may be at risk of being terminated. The quiet quitter also risks their reputation. If they do end up being fired, or if they do manage to find a new job on their own, they're not likely to receive a very glowing recommendation. Quietly quitting can also have a negative impact on the employee's feeling of self-worth. I wanted to discuss the dichotomy between quiet quitting and encouraging a work-life balance. You know, quiet quitting is different from employees wanting to prioritize their work-life balance. I think this is a very poignant distinction that needs to be made. Employees who are conscious of their work-life balance are not at all the same as those who are quietly quitting. Setting boundaries through transparent communication and setting expectations is healthy. And that is very different from becoming disengaged and detached from your job and colleagues. But if an employee is just coasting, they're probably not learning. They're likely not enhancing their promotional opportunities, not experiencing career growth or personal growth. These are all risks to the quiet quitter. And the last point on this slide that I wanted to briefly address is that quiet quitters may be ineligible for unemployment benefits. While that's not a foregone conclusion, it is an additional risk to consider. Gotcha. Catherine, those are all great points, but do you have any recommendations that employers should consider when addressing quiet quitting? Yeah, it's a really good question, David. I think it's important for employees themselves to consider why they're quietly quitting. Do they feel that they're being overworked and underpaid? If so, it would make sense to speak with their manager and make expectations clearer and discuss salary. Is the employee experiencing burnout and quietly quitting in an attempt to shield themselves from full burnout? Again, communicating this to the team and management is an important step. Burnout often stems from unrealistic expectations or deadlines. Workloads piling up without supervisors inquiring if the employee has the bandwidth to take on those new projects. And sometimes with remote and hybrid work, it's really hard for a manager or team to recognize when an employee is feeling overworked or overburdened. So this is just another reason why communication is so key. Now, on the other hand, is it possible that the job simply is not a good fit? There are certain industries and professions in which a work like in a, which a work life balance can be tricky to maintain consistently. Can you give some examples, maybe? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, by way of illustration, as an attorney, I rarely am able to work Monday through Friday, nine to five. I frequently work on memos and respond to emails in the evenings and over the weekends, but I recognize that that's part of the job. If the work outside of Monday through Friday, nine to five, didn't fit well with my mental well being or my aspirations, it would be my responsibility to reassess, not to become disengaged with my work. That would be a huge disservice to my colleagues, to my firm, to my clients, 
And frankly, to myself, I definitely respect work-life balance and make a huge effort to make it to all my various family events. But I do recognize that as a litigator, there are weeks in which I'm going to have to put in far more than the bare minimum. That's simply the reality of my profession. Got you. So can you talk a little bit more about some steps employers can take to address this, you know, in, in terms of some other things maybe they could be doing, asking questions or things along those lines? Yes, absolutely. So employers should consider the working environment itself. You know, is the employee perhaps in a toxic work environment? Are they being faced with unreasonable expectations and deadlines? Is it possible that there's some ongoing harassment or maybe even workplace bullying? Quiet quitters are not always the problem. Oftentimes, they're put in a situation in which it's impossible for them to thrive. It's entirely possible that the employee doesn't trust their manager or employer to adequately moderate their workload, to ensure reasonable expectations, or to compensate them sufficiently. So an easy first step is to open lines of communication. You need to get a good sense of the lay of the land, so to speak. Ascertain what the current problem is and whether this can easily be modified. Oftentimes, these issues are very fixable. Another solution is for the employer to reevaluate the employee job descriptions periodically. This helps to ensure the responsibilities are truly realistic. Oftentimes, job creep happens where an employee's responsibilities continue to increase and increase until it becomes unmanageable for one person. Beth is going to speak about how non-static job descriptions are later on in the program as well. Also, be aware of the possibility that management may be trying to quietly fire the employee specifically through increasing the demands, the expectations, and responsibilities of the employee. Beth is going to discuss this in more detail shortly, but ensuring that managers and supervisors are aligned is imperative. You know, that's a great point, but it made me think of something. When we do investigations and when we talk to people about doing investigations, we talk about having an open mind and being objective when you launch an investigation, I think the same is true when dealing with a quiet quitter. Does that make sense, Catherine? No, it makes perfect sense. And again, David, you know, I think that piggybacks nicely on my prior point with respect to communication. Um, you know, you have to open the lines of communication. You have to figure out exactly what's going on. And you don't want to go in with any preconceived notions. You have to go in with an open mind and um, just be ready to face any of the, any of the answers that you hear. Um, you know, as to perhaps why the employee is struggling, why they seem to be less engaged, why they're not, you know, going above and beyond as, as much as perhaps they were at a previous time. So that's, that's an excellent point that you just made, David. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, Beth, it's your turn. Um, what is the concept of quiet firing? Also, are there any benefits to the employer in quiet firing? Sure, David. So the concept of quiet firing, it's a practice in which a manager or a company as a whole forces an employee out. They offer fewer assignments, they change work responsibilities, they shift key tasks, there's no, assign, uh, no assignment of new opportunities, they're setting unreasonable performance targets or deadlines, and they're providing little to no feedback. They're not providing expected raises or bonuses, they're forcing an employee to relocate or work in the office when others can work remotely, canceling meetings last minute. It may seem like there are benefits. Um, it's certainly less confrontational, but if they take this passive aggressive approach and they create a, an environment that causes the employee to leave quote unquote voluntarily, it does avoid that confrontation and it can allow an employee time to find a new position, but these benefits are a trap for the unwary. The risks involved in this practice far outweigh any perceived benefits. Can you go back one slide? 
Okay, so uh, Beth, can you talk about what those risks are? Oh, sure, of course. So it really is a risky practice for employers. They should be mindful that just one manager alone can engage in this practice, even if the company as a whole is not engaging in it and does not condone it. An employer may just have one very confrontation avoiding manager who engages in this practice. It can expose a company to claims of discrimination if the employee was not offered the opportunity to discuss the issues that the employer had with performance. Not offering a performance improvement plan can lead to claims. And it can also lead to a claim of constructive termination. Such claims can result in litigation and they're costly to a business. It can also harm the company's reputation and it squanders potential. An employer may lose a very valuable employee to the bad management of just one manager who in, decides to engage in this practice. That's great. Now, from the employee's perspective, does the employee face any risks? Uh, absolutely. And it, it piggybacks on what Catherine was talking about with quiet quitting. There's a loss of self-esteem for the quietly fired employee. It can cause stress. They feel a loss of control and uncertainty. It can also create uncertainty for remaining employees, and it can have an impact on morale and engagement for the remaining employees. Got you. Um, before we jump to the top 10 list, I think a couple of things that jump to come to mind. When an employee is underperforming and the Employers looking to maybe have an employee leave, but they don't want to have the confrontation. They want to give the person some additional time before they, you know, to, to find a job, or they just don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Some managers might be amiable. The problem is, is that if an employee senses that they're being targeted in one way or another, and they go to a law firm, and there's a well-known plaintiff side employment law firm called Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. And they get, they retain the firm. The firm's going to assert a claim because everybody pretty much falls under one protected class or another, and they make a complaint of discrimination. And now you cannot terminate the employee without facing the risk of retaliation. So it's something to put in the back of your mind that if you put things off, maybe you're trying to do it for the right reason, you do run into troubles. With that, let's jump ahead to the top 10 list. And for those of you who've seen prior webinars that the White Law Group puts on by uh, Catherine and myself, and this is our first chance to have Beth join us, and we're thrilled by that, we do like to have a top, top 10 list. And grab your writing stick, whether it's a pen or a pencil, and take some notes because here are some great takeaways. And Catherine, can you kick us off, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. So the first one is just a recap of how employers can recognize quiet quitting. Employees are gradually becoming less engaged, less responsive, and overall less available. They may be less likely to volunteer for projects, or perhaps they'll claim that they're too busy with their current workload to help their teammates. Now, it's possible that they actually are too busy to help their teammates. Their current workload might be too intense for them. So again, and I'll get to this point, uh, the third bullet point here, this loops perfectly back into communication. Um, but generally, quiet quitting is when an employee suddenly drops down to doing the very bare minimum and this can also include slips to both their performance, but also to their collegiality. Uh, Beth, would you mind perhaps addressing reasonable expectations? Sure thing. It's very important for an employer to have clear, reasonable expectations for their employees and know how to do it. They have to make sure their employees understand the duties and responsibilities for their roles and the employer also has to ensure that the employee understands what's expected of them. And they have to be aware and involved. Those are great points, Beth. Um, 
So, you know, solid communication actually goes hand in hand with setting those clear expectations that you just discussed. Um, this holds true for both quiet quitting and for quiet firing. The employer owes it to its employees to outline those clear, reasonable expectations, just as Beth described for each role. But then you need to take it a step further and actually communicate those expectations. Employees themselves also should feel empowered to speak up when they're feeling burnout or if they're ever unclear on what is expected of them. I think that's so important. Uh, communication in so many different ways of respect is critical in, in the workforce. Uh, and also creating an environment where people feel free to communicate, where it's safe to communicate. The perception still more often than not is it's not safe to communicate if you've got anything that you might feel is an unpleasant topic to talk about with a, super, a supervisor or from a manager to HR or leadership. Right. And number four, yeah. Oh, if I could actually just say one more thing about communication before we jump to the fourth point. Um, it's a little bit of a different perspective on communication, but employers need to recognize that the employees are gonna also be communicating with one another, right? So this goes back to employee engagement and overall employee morale. If you have one employee who's really slacking, um, who's not communicating as to why that might be happening, there's gonna be that snowball effect where the other employees are going to have to pick up that slack. They're going to recognize that somebody isn't doing their job the way that they used to do that. And that can lead to animosity and breeding resentment amongst colleagues. So that's another problem. It's just a different, different way of looking at communication. You know, not only does the employee need to communicate with the employer, you have to recognize that the employees are talking to one another as well. And sometimes Rumors can start, but it really is about that resentment that can start to breed, and that's very dangerous. Yeah, we've seen that, haven't we? Yes, absolutely. Too many times. Okay, how about assumptions, Beth? Sure. Uh, an employer should absolutely avoid making assumptions. Whether it's about an employee or a manager, assumptions can be and are often wrong. Acting on an assumption can lead to quiet firing taking root. A conversation with the employee about performance issues is always the better course of action. This ties into what Catherine was talking about with communication. If you're seeing an employee who is not meeting deadlines, who it seems like they're starting to disengage, the employer should be having a conversation with that employee, not assuming it's a bad employee. You can ask them what they're doing and you might find an answer you didn't expect. For, like, if, for example, they have a sick child and it's really impacting their work performance. Well, now maybe they need an accommodation you can work on with them instead of assuming it's just a bad employ employee. That's a great point. Uh, this reminds me a bit of bias. Um, people have implicit bias. You know, you meet someone for the first time, maybe they're like me, I'm 62 years old, and you assume, oh, he's 62 and he's old school. He's not gonna get computers or technology. He might be a little bit slower. Maybe he needs a nap and warm milk and cookies in the afternoon. Whatever those assumptions are, there's that bias. But when you hear that an employee is not performing well, why? Why is that happening? Um, and, you know, like Beth said, it could be there's a health issue in the family. Um, it could be a person's going through a bad breakup, or it could be maybe that the manager isn't giving that person a fair opportunity to thrive in the job, or maybe they're getting picked on by another employee. You know, there's so many different things. So the assumption about the employee is no better or no worse than having implicit bias or even explicit bias about somebody. That kind of is a good segue into the work environment. Catherine? Sure, that's a great point, David, thank you. So similar to what David was just discussing and also to the previous point that Beth just made, it's really important for employers not to make the assumption that it's the employee themselves who is the problem with respect to quiet quitting. 
it's entirely possible, and frankly, it's quite likely that there are that there are unreasonable expectations that are being made of the employee, or perhaps the employee is unclear on what those expectations of them are. It's also entirely possible that the employee is being bullied or even harassed in the workplace. This again is synergistic to my prior take home message of the importance of communication. You know, if you don't ask what's going on, you're not going to know. And that can lead to serious problems, including potential disparate treatment. Uh, Beth is going to talk a little bit more about this, I believe, in our last top 10 bullet point. So considerations that the employer should have during the termination process and post-termination is the morale of the remaining employees. And also they should be considering, have they stuck to a well-established and clearly communicated policy with respect to termination? And if they don't have one, they should get one. Good points, Beth. Um, I remember earlier today, you and I were actually talking a little bit about exit interviews. Um, is that something that you maybe want to talk about now, or am I jumping the gun? And is that something we're going to talk about with one of the, the later on? No, sure. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that right now. Awesome. It's great. It's a, it's a great procedure and policy to have to conduct an exit interview. If an employee has been terminated, and you do an exit interview, the employer has an opportunity to find out, oh, maybe this happened because I have a manager who forced this employee out. The employer will also get the opportunity to hear about the impact on that employee. The employer will get the opportunity to hear whether or not maybe there was some harassment that they should be investigating, and maybe even make a, a determination that the employee shouldn't be terminated. Exit interviews are always an opportunity for information for the employer to do the right thing and to grow. That's a great point. And that's a good segue into the training of managers. Catherine, could you kick this off? Sure, I'd be happy to. From the quiet quitting perspective, it's important that managers be trained to pick up on the signs of quiet quitting and then to understand how to proactively approach the employee in question. Remember, the employee may not be the root of the problem. It's important to evaluate the workplace itself, the job description of the employee, the dynamics between the employee and their team, and to understand the value of open and transparent communication. Management training is something that all three of us train on all the time, and we'd be happy to help you and your organization if you feel that you would benefit from some management training. That being said, management training is also important as it's related to quiet firing. Um, and Beth, you know, before I ask you to share your thoughts on the quiet firing side of it, David, I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about management training. I know that you've been doing this for many, many moons, and this is something uh, that you really pride yourself in. Is there anything in particular that you'd like to share about management training with our webinar attendees? Oh, thank you so much. But I, I would go back a teeny bit before that. Uh, managers oftentimes know they have to give a performance evaluation once a year to employees. And some companies, maybe it's twice a year. But it's important to take a close look at what those evaluations include. Are the questions objective or subjective? Are they open to interpretation by a manager? Uh, once you rewrite your performance evaluation, the next step is to have that meeting with the employee. And it should not come as a surprise if there are concerns with the quality of the employee's work. Uh, and But that happens so often and I've seen it and it's been a part of litigation for, yeesh, I hate to say it, more than 30 years. And that is the employee gets a performance evaluation and then there's really no feedback on or management of the employee for the next 
12 months until they get the next performance evaluation. It's so important that the managers understand that managing 24 seven, 52 weeks a year is an integral part of the job. And it's so important to give that feedback. Constructive feedback isn't always negative. It can be positive feedback. Let the employee know how they're doing. It should never be a surprise if the employee is underperforming and if the manager is doing the job properly, the, the manager will catch if the employee is starting to skate and not do what is expected of the, of the employee. And in fact, one can argue that the manager, we talked about job descriptions a few minutes ago, but the manager's job description has got to include leading that team, managing that team 24 seven. And I just think it's so critical to train the managers on how to lead teams. We alluded to a little, a little bit earlier, it's more challenging now with remote workforces. Are your managers trained on working with a team where some people might be in the office and others are not in the office? You know, I, I had a meeting with a client a couple of months ago where it turned out that there were maybe six of 10 employees in the office and the other four are remote. And the remote people felt like they were not taking this seriously anymore. They were logging in for meetings and they're on Zoom when everyone else is in the office, kidding around, slapping each other in the back and having a grand old time. And they're removed, they're remote. They felt almost like it's a Thanksgiving table. And instead of being with the grownups, they're put in the corner with the kids and they did not feel respected. And it led to some quiet quitting by two of those people. Um, so I've seen that quite a bit. So please train your managers on how to lead the teams, but also on their communication with HR. If they've got an employee who's not quite up to snuff, let HR know. Don't wait a week, a month, two months. Let them know now. I, I would add one other thing. I mentioned before that risk of retaliation so that if the employee goes to do we cheat him and how, for those, for those of you who are not attorneys, retaliation is an employee makes a complaint either by themselves or through a third party like an attorney of some form of discrimination identifying a protected activity. And within close temporal proximity, the person gets terminated. That's a, that's a retaliation case. And though, although the law varies from state to state, something that happens within three or four months is close temporal proximity. The employee can argue, but for the complaint, I would not have been fired. So it's that easy for them to make that retaliation case. And any judge will tell you, retaliation cases are the easiest cases for the employee to prove. Catherine, I hope I didn't go too far afield, but that's my answer to your question. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, you make an excellent point. The retaliation claims um, are definitely easier to prove than discrimination claims typically. So that's definitely a risk of, of quiet firing. Um, David, you also had mentioned constructive feedback from management. And I just wanted to follow up on that briefly because uh, in so many cases, you know, if management is not providing constructive feedback to the employee, then in many ways, management is setting that employee up or dooming them rather to fail. Um, and that's unfair to both the employee, but also to the rest of the team and overall to the entire workforce. Um, so yes, constructive feedback is, is massively important. Um, so with that, Beth, did you wanna share some of your thoughts on um, how management training is uh, further important to um, quiet firing? Oh, absolutely, Catherine, thank you. Proper management training can help avoid having quiet firing happen in your company by just one manager. If you're training everybody, you can train them not to engage in this practice. And you can also figure out whether or not you've got someone in a management position who doesn't like conflict. That is one of the key issues in quiet firing. It's a passive aggressive way to terminate an employee. And if you have someone in a management position 
who oversees a team and they've decided for whatever reason there's someone they don't like or someone who's not carrying the weight, but they don't want to talk to them and they don't want to have any conflict. They just want to quietly shift assignments away. Management training is going to help managers not do this. It's very, very important part of your training to make sure that managers understand if there's an issue with an employee, they have to talk to them and they have to talk to them as it's happening. They can't wait and just hope that it stops or hope that the employee quits because all of that is going to open the employer back up to claims, risks, risk of claims, as we were discussing earlier. That's great. I'd like to add one more point before we jump on to job descriptions. And that is, uh, remember a case I had not that long ago where the company decided to promote the salesperson with the best sales numbers to manage the team. The position was open. They figured this person's got the best numbers. They must know a thing or two. They put the person into that role as leader of the team without considering whether or not this person had any interest in managing other people or just wanted to go out and sell, 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 sell. Well, it turns out the person had no interest in managing other people, did not pro provide guidance or feedback to the other members of the team, was impatient, didn't want to answer questions, and they had a mass exodus. A bunch of the other salespeople left because of this manager. So it's in addition to making sure we train the managers, it's important to take the pulse and the temperature of the managers to see if they actually want to manage a team. If that's something that they are excited about doing and want to take the time to develop the skills to do it really, really well. Um, Beth, could you jump in on job descriptions? Oh, absolutely, David, thanks. It's important for an employer or a manager to recognize that a job description is not static. There has to be room and flexibility for the employee's job description to change. Sometimes a new client will come in and there's a different task that's gonna have to be done because of that to meet the needs of that particular client. Employers should be flexible and open to conversations with their employees about whether and how the employee's role may change or need to change instead of being rigid and forcing an employee out because he or she didn't wanna take on that new task or didn't know how to take on that new task. Employers need to be adaptable. As do employees, uh, the flexibility of, in a job description will really help the employer keep good employees. And I think, the job description ties back into communication. These employers and managers have to be com communicating with their employees to ask, have your duties changed? Do you feel like your duties have changed? Do you feel like you can do the tasks that are asked of you? Do you need training? If, if an employer understands that a job description is not static and can change, then they're gonna be open to having these kind of conversations as opposed to being rigid and just deciding employee isn't doing the right thing because they're not meeting A, B, and C on the job description that was given to them. Those are great points, Beth. And I love that you raised the question of asking, you know, do you need training? I think it's really important for employers and management uh, to make sure that their employees have all the resources available to them that they need to truly succeed in their jobs, especially as their job descriptions do continue to change. Um, you know, from time to time over the years, you'll notice that job creep does set in and jobs tend to become um, busier, you know, just by nature of continuing to work in a certain position, your workload is likely to increase. And sometimes when your workload increases, you might not necessarily have the resources that you need to remain successful in that position. So it's really important, uh, A, for management to be able to offer those resources to the employee, but B, for the employee also to feel comfortable and empowered to speak up and say, hey, you know, over the past several months or because these new clients have come in or because I've been assigned these new roles and responsibilities, I need help. 
you know, I don't necessarily have the training that I need to be able to do this well. And again, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but this all goes right back to the importance of transparent communication. It's so vitally important. Um, so thank you, Beth, for bringing up that point. That was, that was excellent. You know, uh, Catherine and Beth, one of the major contributors to the great resignation was bad communication, mm -hmm. was not having these types of conversations with employees, and the employees felt that they were not valued. Um, and I, so I think it's something that even though we're past that great resignation, it's still certainly relevant. So Catherine, how about a little bit of work-life balance? Oh, certainly. So this bullet point is near and dear to me. Work-life balance is vital for the workforce. And if management notices that an employee is prioritizing their work-life balance, they need to recognize that that does not necessarily mean that the employee is quietly quitting. Again, with strong communication and clear expectations, it is possible for employees to feel a strong sense of work-life balance while managing to remain an effective member of the team and demonstrating strong work performance. You know, I think that at our law, law firm, for example, within our employment law team, we work very, very hard, but we are also able to maintain a work-life balance largely because of the transparency and open communication amongst our team members. Um, and even though we're able to prioritize the work-life balance, we, we do that while remaining strong and effective team members. Our work performance stays strong. We don't have this slipping um, of being less engaged or less available. Uh, so work-life balance, I think, is really, truly vital to the general overall well-being of the individual employees and of the workforce as a whole. Catherine, one of the things to accomplish work-life balance is if you know you've got something that's going to be all hands on deck either later this week, next week, the week after, let the members of the team know sooner than, sooner than later. Don't say, oh, um, five o'clock on Thursday. Oh, by the way, tomorrow we're doing a 15-hour day. <laughs> talk, talk today about it. And also, if somebody works with more than one team, let the other leaders know you're going to need this person or these people for this major project as soon as it becomes evident that this is something that you've got to deal with. Don't just wait till the last minute and tell people. Um, that's a lack of respect, uh, and it will not only have an impact on the employee, but it could have an impact on the project. Um, so, Beth, can you talk about consistency? Uh, absolutely. It, sometimes, I mean, you read consistent treatment of all employees and you feel like if it were a question, it would answer itself. Why do you need consistent treatment of all employees? To avoid claims of discrimination, to avoid claims of constructive discharge. But it takes on a little bit of a nuance with respect to quiet firing. Consistent treatment of all employees, if that is a company's policy, they will avoid the pitfalls of quiet firing because as we've been discussing, they will have trained their employees, their management team. And if they treat everyone the same way and they have a policy that with open communication, it's going to help them spot very quickly whether or not someone is engaging in quiet firing. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as you can see by hearing Beth and Catherine, they have a ton of passion for what they do. And they actually, I could speak from experience, they love what they do. And one of the things more than anything else that we take pride in is helping people avoid problems before they ever arise. So please feel free to reach out to any one of us with any questions that you've got, if you want a copy of the slides or the recording, because you want to hear us a second and maybe even a third time, you certainly are welcome to reach out to us. We're here to help any way we can. Thank you so much for joining us for this program today. Have a wonderful, wonderful remainder of your day today. Bye for Thanks now. Thanks for your time. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everybody.